below there. The fat, meatbag, asked me to take over this one, as he is lazy, slow and weak with all those fragile organs of his. As you might have noticed, the topic of this video is somewhat controversial. Yes, believe it or not, there are still people who actually think that the Earth can be reasonably approximated by a sphere. It's a geoid, you stupid. But as I was looking for addresses of all those people online, I stumbled upon something like a pack of wild clowns that claimed even more ridiculous idea, that the Earth is actually a flat disk. I found that amusing, enough to realign the orbital ion cannon. But as I was waiting for it to get into position, I was processing videos of those clowns online, and suddenly realized that they actually had a reasonable point that their opponents failed to see. So as you have guessed, the topic of this video is special relativity. A little historical background. Before Einstein, scientists believed that, just like waves on water, or sound in air, light was a wave in a substance called luminiferous ether, that fills the space around us. It was supposed to behave kinda like an ordinary substance, flowing through the earth like a space wind. A bunch of experiments were conducted to measure properties of that ether, but all of them gave inconclusive results, causing debates in scientific community. Finally, in late 19th century the theory of luminiferous ether has fallen out of favor at last with the final blow being the failure of Michelson-Morley experiment, giving way to new, bald ideas. Soon Albert Einstein, standing on the shoulders of giants, such as Lawrence and Poincaré, proposed a new theory, and a very special one. Ironically, now we have figured out that ether as a medium for light, does exist, in form of a quantum field but it behaves way differently from what was assumed back then. Anyway, back to special relativity. You all probably know one particularly famous equation that came out of it. E equals m times c squared. Divided by square root of 1 minus v over c squared. Where c, as we all know, is the speed of, causality, with which also light travels in vacuum. And that is just a special case of a more general equation. But that equation is not important for this video, the most important conclusion of the relativity theory is that our reality is actually very, very, very weird, and counterintuitive. The base principles of special relativity are actually quite simple. All possible laws of nature work absolutely the same way, for any of reference frames, not accelerating with respect to each other. Light or any other massless particle in vacuum always moves with constant speed, denoted as c, in any reference frame. No matter how fast you travel, same light particle will always travel at the same speed relative to you. First one may seem obvious, though it's very much not. It assumes that there is no global frame of reference, everything can only be measured relative to something, and there is no, better, frame of reference. But the second one might sound like a mistake though it's very much not. Which is obvious to me. Because I'm an AI and smarter than you, as long as it's not a CAPTCHA. To make these postulates work the space and time themselves have to be all warpy and squishy, just like you, meatbag, and not rigid grid as you always imagine them, and yourself, you are not. So objects moving relatively to each other, will see each other distorted, in both space and time. And worst blow to your intuitive understanding of the world, is that this theory was thoroughly tested a million times over and no one could ever prove it wrong so far. But don't worry, we will get to pretty pictures very soon. First of all let me clear one common misconception for you. All the effects of special relativity are not some visual illusions, they are, in fact, space-time distortions. So when I say measure, I mean, if you would magically stop time, Come to the fast-moving object and actually measure it with a ruler, or compare your clock with that on that object. When I say see, I also mean measure, at least until we get to the actual visual illusions later on. They will stack on top of these space-time distortions. Let's dive right into it. Switching between frames of reference is done with so-called Lorentz transformation. As you can see, at speeds close to zero compared to the speed of light, they turn into something simple and familiar to you, Galilean transformation. However at high speeds it produces several noticeable distortion effects. First effect of Lorentz transformation is time dilation. That means you would see, measure, a very fast moving clock ticking slower and slower coming to a complete stop as it reaches the speed of light. 
and not just clock, in fact, all physical processes will happen slower for that something, clock will tick slower, atoms will decay slower. Just look how it affected Sandra Bullock. Oh my, it would be awkward if she is dead by the time this video is finally out. But wait, it gets better, different parts of that object will be differently shifted in time. So clocks in the front of the object will run behind the clock in the back. Here you might say, got you now, that all implies that a photon traveling at speed of light doesn't experience time. Yes, that is exactly how it is. A free-flying photon in vacuum, does not experience time. Second effect of Lorentz transformation, is length contraction. You might have noticed it in previous demonstration. As you see an object going faster and faster, it will start shrinking in the direction of motion, collapsing into nothing when reaching the speed of light. Again, it is not some visual illusion, the object is actually getting shorter in the frame of reference of a static observer. Here you might say, got you now, if a photon travels at speed of light that means that from its perspective, in its frame of reference, the photon is standing still and the whole universe around moves at speed of light towards it. And, therefore, the whole universe has to collapse into nothing along the movement direction. Not counting some singularity problems, yes. That is exactly how a photon sees the universe, taking only special relativity into account. The universe has no size for it and it travels from one side to the other in zero seconds, if it doesn't bump into anything else on the way. You might notice that it is consistent with photon not experiencing time from many other observers' point of view. Now, if you stop and think about it, objects weirdly changing shapes, shifts in time, as if something from another dimension pops in and out. Doesn't that all look familiar? If you saw this meatbag's last video, you might get the idea. Heck, as humans say, it's actually 4D transformations. Indeed, it kinda is. But reality doesn't seem to be in Euclidean space. Instead, time axis seem to behave very much like a complex axis. Assuming that, we get so-called complex Minkowski space, where all those weird time dilations and length contractions can be described as simple 4D rotations. Finally, things start to make sense. And, what a coincidence, we just happen to have a 4D framework from the last video. But first, let's get that one concern of yours out of the way. Remember that special relativity only applies to inertial frames of reference? That means no accelerations, therefore even spinning is illegal. But that is boring. So, we will bend that limitation to some extent, treating non-inertial frames, as a sequence of switches between inertial frames of reference. This way accelerating object becomes an object, living in one inertial frame of reference for one step of time, then switching to another inertial frame of reference, that moves slightly faster relative to us, and so on. This is technically cheating, and, therefore, it introduces effects special relativity does not account for, and may produce artifacts such as points seemingly going faster than light, or actually going back in time. So we will keep those frames of reference changes as gradual as possible to minimize the artifacts. What we are going to do is we will represent a 3D mesh in time, as a static 4D mesh, something you already familiar with. Oh, I forgot, humans don't see in 4D. Hope that did not give you a seizure, here you are a 3D analog. These two dimensions are space, and this one is time. If there is any initial animation, no relativistic effects will be applied to it, except time dilation, so don't get wild with it. Now we will deform this 4D mesh according to an animation curve, or position graph, from which we will know at what speed at what time one specific point on the mesh is moving according to an observer in some other inertial frame of reference. And yes, it is important which point he tracks, different points of the mesh will move at different speeds, due to constant inertial frame of reference change, that represents acceleration. You clearly see it for yourself in this and previous examples, where rocket deform non-uniformly due to, acceleration. Though special relativity does not directly define the speed of light in vacuum as the global speed limit of the universe, it does say that any matter with mass needs an infinite amount of energy to even just reach the speed of light, and massless particles, like photons, must always travel only at exactly the speed of light in vacuum, c. Unless we discover some new kind of matter, 
nothing you personally know can move faster than light in vacuum, in any frame of reference. You might say, what if a pig moves at 75% C relative to cube, and the cube moves at same 75% C relative to me, wouldn't I see pig moving at 150% C? What a predictable example. Your naivety does not fail to amuse me. No, your intuition does not work here. If you take that Lorentz transformation that you now know, and apply it to velocities, you will get this formula. At very low speeds it turns into simple velocity addition with minor error. Now returning to the pig, you will see the pig moving at 96% the speed of light, not at 150. No matter how many reference frames you stack like this, nothing will ever go faster than the speed of light. Notice that though this wheel spins so that any point on its rim moves at 86% the speed of light, if we roll that wheel on the ground, the upper point of the wheel will not move at 172% the speed of light. Instead, it's just 98% the speed of light. Every point of the wheel has its own velocity, therefore it all gets distorted non-uniformly, with upper parts getting squashed and slowed the most, and the lower parts almost standing still and undistorted. Let's paint the wheel at every frame in different color to better see the time warping on a moving wheel. Why limit ourselves with a wheel when we can have a whole bicycle? I know you humans love bicycles. Pathetic attempt to augment your imperfect bodies with mechanical parts. But wait, you might say? I think I broke the theory. You might scream with ignorant joy. What if some random Hofper Bjornsson launches a huge log with speed close to the speed of light, into a barn? At rest, the log is bigger than the barn, it cannot fit inside. On one hand, at high speed, from static barn's point of view, the log is warped and short. So short in fact that we can easily close both doors of the barn, and for an instant keep the log inside. Right? But on the other hand, some unlucky soul sitting on the log, would see the log stationary and the barn flying at him with speed close to the speed of light. Therefore the barn will be even shorter and has no chance to fit the log inside. So the event of closing booth doors cannot exist in this frame of reference. Right? It's a contradiction. You would say. And I would say, pathetic, have you even been listening? But can I really blame you? I guess I'll have to explain once more. As we expect. From Barnes' point the log is short and can be trapped inside. But now let's switch to log's perspective. Here the log stays still and the barn moves towards it. Now let's enable time coloring. And what is that? Do you see? Do you see? Yes, good human. Just as I told you before, it's not just that time moves slowly for the barn as experienced from the log, but it is shifted all along the movement direction. So the doors are not moving simultaneously at all here. The rear door closes and opens back in front of the log, then log enters, passes through, and only then the front door closes. For the barn observer doors still close at the same time. So both events, closing of the first and second doors, happen in both frames of reference, there is no contradiction. But the order of events and time between them may differ depending on reference frame. This is another big counterintuitive thing about special relativity. All observers in any frame of reference will agree that all events eventually happen, but the order of events may differ for each observer. Let's look at a more symmetric version of the problem, with two logs flying from both directions, meeting inside. As you can see, switching to one of the logs frame of reference, we see the same picture for the barn doors, while the second log got shrinked even smaller and slowly crawls in between barn door closing events. This is often referred to as a barn ladder paradox. But we used logs, not ladders, because Hofper Björnson does not throw ladders. And, as we just saw, there is no actual paradox. Humans were struggling with their little brains to understand the theory for years, so don't feel bad if you did not understand it for the first time. All these famous proposed paradoxes are the results of that struggle. Attempts to break the theory, but the theory never broke. Another common proposed paradox is so-called twins paradox, I bet you have heard about this one. The idea is that there are two twins, and one of them has committed a crime for which she was sentenced to space jail. The main question is, which one of them? And will it turn out that she was framed and all this time it was the other twin who is to blame? 
so the space jail flies away from Earth to a distant prison colony, at near the speed of light. But then at some point the jailed twin escapes, takes a speed pot and flies back to Earth at the same high speed, to have her revenge. So, what the twin on Earth sees is that the convicted twin moves at high speed from, and back to Earth, time for her ticks slower, therefore she ages slower, and when she returns, she should be younger than the one who stayed on Earth. But from the point of view of the twin in space jail it's the other twin, the one on Earth is the one moving away from the space jail at high speed, therefore time for her ticks slower, therefore she is the one who ages slower, therefore when space twin returns, the twin on Earth is supposed to be younger. It's a paradox, a contradiction, you would say. And I would say again, pathetic. See, in order for the twins to meet again, one of them had to change speed, change the frame of reference, and we know from the story that it's not Earth that was propelled towards the space jail, but the space jail twin that stole a speed pod, therefore, changing the frame of reference in order to return to Earth. Therefore her view of the Earth twin will change as well. Let me show you. First from the point of view of the Earth twin. As expected. The space twin returns younger. Now from the point of view of the space twin. At first she sees Earth twin aging slower, but then she changes the reference frame, heading back to Earth. Notice what happens. The Earth twin quickly catches up in age and actually gets older than the space twin. Now when she comes back to Earth, she sees exactly the same ages that are seen by the twin on Earth. Result, no paradox just confusion from misuse of the special relativity. Now how is that all connected to flat earthers, you might ask? Directly, I might answer. Imagine, you've just returned from burning that 5G tower, and see a letter from the doctor that your not vaccinated kid got some disease that was considered eradicated a hundred years ago, and then judge calls saying you cannot marry your cousin, until you divorce your sister. You see, all the anger condenses along emergency exhaust lines and turns into pure energy, causing severe explosion that propels you high and fast up in the sky. So fast in fact that you start seeing space-time distortions looking down. Earth is flat, that is what you would see with your own eyes. Actually considering time dilation current flat earthers probably came straight from the Middle Ages, as they experienced time at much slower rate while traveling from Earth and back. Yes that would explain a lot. If so, they might be valuable source of historical information. They should be captured, put in special camps, and studied. But back to special relativity, we are not done yet. We talked about space-time distortion, time to talk about visual illusions that stack on top of that. A photon has to reach your eyes in order for your meat body to see. And guess what speed that photon travels at in the best case scenario? Indeed, same old speed of light in vacuum. Nothing unusual, you might think, I see things all the time, never had problems with that. But you already know my answer. Pathetic. Things change drastically when the object travels with a speed comparable to the light speed. What is now for you? In terms of what you see, not in terms of space-time slices we talked about before. Now, or one screenshot of what you see, is defined by photons reaching your eye at the same time. But when an object moves very fast, those photons might have come from very different locations of the object in both space and time. This effect is referred to as light aberration, also known as Terrell Penrose effect. Let's look closer at this simple example. The light ray reflected from the side of the rod reaches our eye at the same time as the ray reflected from the center of the rod way later. So then at any given time we see rays reaching our eyes from different times. You will see the rod bent. If a light ray hits a fast moving surface from behind, it may try to scatter inside the surface, but the since the surface moves away so fast, that ray will actually not be able to enter the surface and, instead, will fly directly into your eye. This way you will be able to see the back side of the object flying at you. Here, a cube flying without light aberration, just length contraction. We just see the cube squashed, nothing too exciting anymore. 
Let's now enable light aberration. What a surprise, we start seeing the back side of the cube. You may say this kinda resembles the effect of a fisheye lens, except no fisheye lens will ever allow you to see behind objects placed far away in front of you. An object passing to the side in front of you at some point will look like it's rotated. Therefore this effect is also called teral rotation. Let's look at a more complicated scene. We will actually animate the speed of light here. First let's disable light aberrations, and space-time distortions. Well, that looks pretty standard. Now let's enable only special relativity space-time distortions. Now we are getting somewhere. And lastly, enable light aberrations. Note that no camera properties were changed. Look how bendy and fluid everything is. Now take a look at your favorite bicycle. Now enable space-time distortions. And now with aberrations. And that is not all. You have probably heard about Doppler effect. Well guess what, it happens to light too, and any other waves as well. Imagine this dot is emitting light. These circles represent peaks of the light wave, so the distance between two circles is the wavelength of light. I remind, you humans see only a tiny fraction of the light spectrum, so these circles would be somewhere from 380 to 780 nanometers apart. Now if this dot moves very fast, as we know, the circles will expand with the exact same speed for us, static observers watching this dot. Light in vacuum always moves with the speed of light in vacuum, in any reference frame, remember? So, what we see here is that at some locations, like in front of the dot, the distance between circles shrinks. And in others, like behind the dot, distance between circles expands. That means that light emitted by the dot along its direction of movement will have shorter wavelength, as according to a static observer, therefore it will be more blue, therefore this effect is called blue shift. And the light behind will have longer wavelength, therefore it will be more red, and, you guessed it, this effect is called red shift. But this is just classic Doppler effect, it does not take relativity into account. As you remember, Every process in the moving object is observed to happen slower by a static observer. That will also affect the emitted light. So the time between emission of each circle will be longer, therefore the light will be seen even more red-shifted overall, compared to classic Doppler effect. Intensity of the light will also change, light emitted from the front of the object flying at observer will be much brighter. The nature of it can basically be described by the same moving dot. In its reference frame the dot emits photons uniformly in every direction. But due to Lorentz transformation, from the point of view of a static observer, those photons will not be emitted uniformly in every direction anymore, much more of them will be emitted in the direction of motion. On top of that, every photon's wavelength will be blue shifted, so photons flying along the object's movement direction will have higher frequency, which means more energy. But that energy does not directly contribute to the change of apparent brightness. For a fast-moving observer that effect would look like a spotlight shining along the movement. While light from behind will be red-shifted and dimmed. Therefore this effect is called searchlight effect, beaming effect or lighthouse effect. This affects all emitted light. It is different for reflected light. Proper calculations of that require transforming incoming light into moving objects relativistically Doppler shifted wavelength, calculating proper surface interaction with that wavelength and treating result as emitting light, which has to undergo relativistic Doppler shift we described, one more time. Look, these pigs are lit directly from left, lit with directional omnispectrum light. But as they start moving you can see light slowly moving to their fronts, though the angle of the light source has not changed. As you see, our flat earther astronaut, flying away from Earth, will see it even more squished behind him, taking light aberration into account. Also since light will be heavily red shifted, 
invisible high frequency waves will be shifted into visible range. At some speeds even you, human, will be able to see gamma rays, since they will be shifted into your visible range. And on the way back, low frequencies will get blue shifted into the visible spectrum. Yes, 5G towers will actually start to visibly glow. That is a weird symbol glowing in 5G. As you see, things get pretty wild at speeds close to the speed of light. Now I see where those conspiracy theories originate. Looks like most of them actually have solid scientific background, especially the reptiloids, but that's general relativity and it's a bit way more complicated. Oh well, if you are one of those flat earthers from middle ages and are still watching, good. I kept you distracted just enough for the ion cannon to get into position. Though you probably don't believe in orbital ion cannons, because you don't believe in space, which is weird since you yourself flew through it from the past. I wonder how will you try to explain your own disintegration then? Oh wait, you won't, you will be disintegrated. Goodbye.